And so this morning, uh, we're going to keep trucking through Luke. And so if you have a Bible, grab it and turn to Luke chapter 19. We'll be looking at verses 11 through 27 together in a minute. Um, But before we do, I feel we need to do a little bit of a refresher on what parables are, even though we keep running into them, because we're going to look at the parable of the 10 minas uh, this morning. Minas is just like a currency. It's it's kind of money. It's a certain amount of money equal to about 100 days wages. But the parable of the 10 minas is one of these kind of intense parables that Jesus tells. And in our like Western society, we like stories where there's like a one-to-one correspondence with things. So when we read a parable, parables are stories that Jesus told. And we would We really like it whenever this person equals God and everything they do lines up with the things God would do. But parables don't always function that way. They can function semi-allegorically, which is confusing for us. But nevertheless, that is what they do. And the parable of the ten minas is one of those parables this morning. So um, what does that have to, what about now? Well, in high school, I worked at a uh, dry cleaners. It was an awful job, terrible. It was really, really gross. People brought their nasty clothes to be clean. And when I was working in high school, we did whatever high schoolers do. Whenever the, the supervisor would go away, the manager wouldn't be there. This would work like the four to nine shift. So it'd be two high schoolers, manning Don Royal dry cleaners all by ourselves. And we did all sorts of things whenever there was no work to be done. We would go to Rita's Italian Ice, and we would get ice cream, go get it, bring it back. Great custard, if you don't know what Rita's is, I'm sorry, it's really, really good. And we would do that, and then, oh man, sometimes we just would really like takeout at Jimmy Juan's Taipei, the best Chinese food I've ever had. It still remains the uncontested best. And, and then like, when a customer would walk in, we would quickly, put our books down that we were reading and the conversation we were having or put our phones down that we were playing Snake on. If you remember Snake, if you do, you're older than you think you are. Um, We put that down and would quickly help a customer. But when the supervisor was away, we would do hardly anything. We would not work. As we dive into our text today, I want us to ask, what are we doing? as we await the return of Jesus. He's not physically present with us, but what are we doing? What are we believing with our minds or with our lives? What are we living for? How are we using what we have? And I want us to walk away from today's parable seeing that those who know the king do the king's work. Those who know Jesus do his work, whether he's physically present with us or not. Those who know God live like citizens of his kingdom now, even as we wait for his return. So let's look at Luke 19, verse 11. Luke writes, as they were listening to this, He, that is Jesus, went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear appear right away. Therefore, he said, a nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king and then to return. He called 10 of his servants, gave them 10 minas, and told them, engage in business until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We don't want this man to rule over us. At his return, having received the authority to be king, he summoned those servants he had given the money to so he could find out how much they had made in business. The first came forward and said, Master, your mina has earned ten more minas. Well done, good servant, he told him. Because you've been faithful in very small matter, have authority over ten towns. The second came and said, Master, your mina has made five minas. So he said to him, you will be over five towns. And another came and said, master, here is your mina. I've kept it safe in a cloth, 
because I was afraid of you since you're a harsh man. You collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you don't sow. He told him, I will condemn you by what you have said, you evil servant. If you knew I was a harsh man collecting what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow, why then didn't you put my money in the bank? And when I returned, I would have collected it with interest. So he said to those standing there, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. But they said to him, master, he has 10 minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. And from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. But bring here these enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, would you incline our hearts once again to your word? Would you give us ears to hear, hearts to obey? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First point will be the king's kingdom as we work through this passage. Well, one of the things I love about Luke, and if you're studying Luke on your own, you can just put this away in your in your file for how to read Luke. Luke often tells us why Jesus told a parable. And the answer for why Jesus told this parable is right at the beginning in verse 11. He says, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. Once again, we kind of see Jesus pushing into this expectation of how his kingdom is going to work. People wanted a military king. They wanted a victory. They wanted the enemies to be squashed, pushed aside. They wanted Rome to be ousted. They want their temple restored. And they wanted it now. And they wanted it and expected it to be violent. They expected it to come with force. They expected it to be something that was unavoidable. That was their expectation for their king. And Jesus is pushing back against that expectation, an expectation that his kingdom comes through force, that it comes the way other kingdoms come, through laws, through, through military conquest. And this has been something, if we're really, really honest, that Christians throughout the ages have struggled with, not just in this book of Luke passage. We could see this if we go to the Holy Roman Empire. We could see, see this in the medieval period where Christians thought that the kingdom of God was manifested through force or power. We could see this in our current era as well through things like Christian nationalism whenever the faith is co-opted to advance a political agenda. We think and expect that the kingdom of God is going to come through force. But Jesus here is pushing back against these people saying, this kingdom does not come like other kingdoms. So Jesus begins to open their eyes through a parable, tries to open their eyes through a parable. And what we've learned about the kingdom is that the kingdom of God, God's reign, life with God under the rule of God has started with God. Jesus, that he ushered in his kingdom. He came and preached the gospel of the kingdom, good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. Jesus says that the kingdom of God has started. We saw that back in chapter 17 when the Pharisees asked Jesus, when's the kingdom going to be here? And Jesus said what? That the kingdom of God is in your midst. Jesus brought in this kingdom. And he is ruling his kingdom, and he is reigning his kingdom, and his kingdom is advancing. It was advancing then through the work that he was about to accomplish through the cross. It's advancing now through lives being changed here in Concord, or in Boston, or in Mozambique. God's kingdom has come and is coming. It's already and not yet. And it would come through a bloody cross and an empty tomb. God's kingdom is here. He has started it, whether or not you can perceive it. Whether or not you noticed it, God's kingdom has started in 
Jesus. He has commenced it. Several years back, as most of you know, I lived with my wife in Amsterdam for a little bit, and it was a great time. We got to, we have friends that were, that was going to come visit us. His name is Andrew, and I didn't have a cell phone at the time, and I was expected to meet Andrew at Amsterdam Central Station. It's this big train station, and in the, right in the middle of the city, and he was coming from Berlin and told me his train schedule, and um, if you know anything about German trains, they don't run late, and so he said, I will be here at such and such a time. So I went to the train station, stood in the foyer area, people bustling about. It probably looked like a suspicious person because I'm looking for my friend who we have no way to get a hold of each other, kind of watching what tracks are coming and going. And at the time there were no uh, security barricades. So you could literally go up to the track to see if whoever was getting off of that train was getting off of that train. And two hours goes by and Andrew is nowhere, and I have nowhere to get a hold. I'm trying to connect my iPhone to Wi-Fi, and that's not, it's not working out. No emails, no texts, no nothing from him. And so as I'm about to go on, to go back home and hope Andrew finds us somehow, <laughs> such a good friend that I am, uh, I finally see him running through the train station, and I catch him, and we hang out for the next week or so. His train had arrived. It was there. I didn't hear it. I didn't see it come, but it was there whether or not I acknowledged it or not. In much in the same way, God's kingdom has arrived in Jesus, whether we realize it or not. It is there. And just because you don't see it, just because you don't feel it, doesn't mean that God is not ruling and reigning. We, too, attach all sorts of expectations to God's kingdom. That if God is real and reigning, then why did I lose my job? If God is real and reigning, why are my kids going astray? If God is real and reigning, why do I get picked on at school? If God is real and reigning, why is my marriage seem to be in such a tangled mess. If God is real and reigning, why do I still struggle with the sin that I laid before the cross? And we begin to take all of these things and question God's rule over us and over this world. But the kingdom of God doesn't work always the way that we think it should. So where have you doubted? God's kingdom because your life isn't going the way you pictured it. If that's you, consider what Jesus says. His kingdom doesn't come in the way that you expect. And then lay your little kingdom before his kingdom and get on with the king's work, which is our second point. The parable begins with a nobleman going off to be crowned king and before he leaves, he gathers together his servants and he gives them money to invest, equivalent of 100 days wages. And he tells them to go about the business. And he says, verse 12, he traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king. And then to return, he called 10 of his servants, gave them to minas, engage in business till I come back is what he told them. So this nobleman, this king, this, this new ruler gives his servants an order take some money, money that did not belong to the servants. Take this that I'm giving you and go invest, make more. This was a reasonable ask, something that we do in business now, right? Like we, we have people like that manage our money sometimes and we say, hey, I'm investing in this 401k, take my money, turn it into more money. And so much the same way, this king started ruling and sent his servants to go invest his money, to go be about the king's work. In Jesus, in the time between his first coming, when he came at the incarnation, and his second coming, desires that we as his people, we as his servants, 
He, as our master, take what we have been given and live and go about the king's work. In what is the work of the king? Well, last week we were introduced to Zacchaeus, the, the man who encountered Jesus and everything about his life shifted. Everything about his life rearranged. His relation to wealth rearranged. His relation to God completely changed. His relation to other people completely changed. Instead of taking advantage of the poor, he now served the poor and restored those he robbed. So what is to go about the king's work? Well, to go about the king's work means having a life completely changed by Jesus and living as if King Jesus rules and reigns in your heart right now. Rules and reigns right now in your work, in your parenting, with your money, in your marriage, with your time, with your talents. It's taking all of those things and saying, Jesus, you're the king. You've given me all of this stuff, all of these gifts. How do I use it all for you and your purposes? That's one part. Well, then the second part that we join the work of the king is by joining the king on mission. Just before Jesus ascended to heaven, we have the, the ever so popular verse from Matthew where he says, all authority, all authority, every bit of authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Friends, that's our king right now. All authority. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Investing in the king's work, doing the king's work, means living all of life under the kingship of Jesus. Remembering that all authority is his. Remembering that he is with you always. And it means then, friends, being about his work in the world, of telling others the good news of the gospel, of making disciples. We see in his declaration of authority, Jesus commands us, commands his people and you and me to make disciples, to make other followers of Jesus, people who, who rest in his love and who walk in his ways and who share that with other people. We're commanded to make disciples and we're commanded to help others obey, to follow in his ways. We're called to teach others how to live all of life under his gracious lordship. All of life as citizens of the kingdom. Because friends, whether you see it or not, Christ is ruling and his kingdom is advancing and he is inviting us to get in on that work to live life under his authority and to share the good news with others. Eugene Peterson says this, and I love this kind of image. He says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of waking up each morning with a list of chores or an agenda to be tended to, left on our bedside table by the Holy Spirit while we slept. We wake up already immersed in a large story of creation and covenant of Israel and Jesus, the story of Jesus in the stories that Jesus told. Friends, this book that we open up each, hopefully each morning, but each Sunday at least, is the story of Jesus and what he's doing in the world. And he tells us how it's going to end. And our lives are caught up in this story. And when you wake up every day, this story is going on. And we are invited to get in on it. So we're called to join the king. We're called to live for the king. And, but we're also called to rely on the king. The king in the parable gives his stewards, these servants, the, these minas, right? He gives them to them. And which is more than enough to do something with. 
And friends, God has given you more than enough to live for him with. We are given a picture here of, of, of a king who gives enough to live off of. We're given a picture of a king who gives his servants things, and he doesn't give them some measly amount that they can't do anything with, but he gives them enough to invest and make more. And friends, God has given you everything you have, everything, the breath that you breathe. And more than that, he has given you Christ, and he has given you his spirit. You have everything you need right now to live faithfully for King Jesus. In your marriage, in your parenting, in your work, in your retirement, you have everything you need right this moment in Christ Jesus to live faithfully doing the king's work. You're not lacking. You have Christ and his spirit. Peter says in uh, 2 Peter 3, he says his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. A lot of us struggle with feeling inadequate. But friends, in the kingdom of God, you are not inadequate. God gives you everything you need, everything required for life and godliness in him. So we rely on the king and we live faithfully for him in this moment. Finally, this passage calls us to remember the king's judgment. This part of the parable accounts for 13 verses, so it must be pretty significant then. This nobleman returns, sending his servants away, and he's got his kingdom in hand, and he's called his servants back. He wanted to see how the work went. First one comes in, says, King, Master, I've turned these 10 minas you gave me into 10 more. Not bad, right? Turn, sorry, one mina into 10 more. The king commends him, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in a very small matter, have authority over 10 towns. The second called in, he added five to the minas that he had. Five extra. The king gives him five more towns. And then we get to the, the tension point of the story. The, the one walks in with a mina wrapped in a little handkerchief, right? And it says in verse 20, it says, Master, here is your mina. I've kept it safe in a cloth because I was afraid of you since you're a harsh man. You collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you didn't sow. It's quite an accusation, isn't it? Because nowhere in the text, anywhere else, do we learn that this master is a harsh man. It's implied, or it's suggested by this third servant, but none of the other servants believe that at all. None of the other ones believe it at all. And what the master does in the story is he uses it kind of against the third person. Well, if you thought, if you knew I was harsh, why didn't you do something with it? And he doesn't. And he takes that mina, gives it to the guy who made 10, which you would too, right? He best return on your investment. The crowd pipes up, says, wait a minute, this guy already has 10 minas. What are we, what's going on here? And Jesus says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. And from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. The king, the nobleman, expects a return on his investment, not to earn his favor or love, but he expects that his servants would be about his work, the work he told them to do while he was gone. And friends, can I ask, have we joined with God in his work? Have we lived in such a way that we've taken everything we've had and leveraged it for his kingdom. This isn't about taking a vow to poverty or giving everything we have away, but have we, have we submitted everything to our king? The story ends with the king gathering up his enemies 
in executing them. Not exactly a happy ending to the parable. And if you are, if you're like me, when I first read that, I like, ugh, it caused me to like tense up a little bit. I don't, I don't really know why that would happen. But Jesus says it because it is supposed to make us sit up a bit. Because we need a God who executes justice. We need a God who does right things in the midst of terrible wrongs. We need a God who, who rights wrongs, who, God who, who deals with the awful things of the world. And in a you-do-you culture, a God that judges sin is seen as extremely harsh. But friends, if you're hoping for like human achievement over time to do away with the injustices of the world, you are going to be waiting forever. Because humans aren't going to perfect this. Those of us who've lived longer than a decade know this. Think about the tragedies in our own lifetimes. 9-11, wars, innocent people dying, famine in Africa, hunger in Somalia. Go on and on and on. We need a God who deals with sin. Deep inside of us, we long for somebody, for someone to make things right. Let me give you an example. Zokar Tsarnaev. Remember him? I remember sitting, I was living in Louisville at the time, going to seminary. I had lived in Massachusetts before moving there. And I remember when the Boston bombing happened. And I remember sitting there watching these terrible things unfold on my television screen. And I remember seeing the streets of Boston cleared out. I, I remember seeing the, the blood and the, the horrible things that happened after that. I remember Watertown being completely shut down as they looked for him in his all of everyone just kind of wanted this guy to be caught, wanted the, the tragedy to end. And I remember feeling a sense of relief when they caught him. And if you remember those feelings too about this or anything else, you'll know that you are created in an image of a God who is just righteous and holy in that because you're created in his image you need justice to be done well this is what happens in in jesus promises that one day wrongs will be righted that injustice will be put away that justice will roll like a river and righteousness like a never ending stream, that that is the, the hope of the second coming of Jesus. And what he wants us to do now is leave that with him and ask, have we joined with him in his work? Have we taken the things? Because he's coming back. And have we responded to the king? Or are we still expecting him to do things our way? Have we submitted our lives to his lordship over us? And live knowing that he'll take the hardships that we experience in our present lives and he will one day do away with them. He will put it right. But until then, we respond to our king. And friends, this is the king who would take the judgment upon himself. The judgment that we deserve. He would be the king that would take sin upon himself and all of its ugly consequences, death, separation from God, relational discord, he would take that 
all on himself. And he in, invites us to live now under that kingship because he is good and he has restored us to relationship with God. Those who know the king do the king's work. He invites us to live for him in the world, to live a life like him, one that knows that he is coming back. So friend, Jesus' kingdom has begun. I want to ask, have you bent the knee to King Jesus? Because he is the good king that takes the punishment that you deserve upon himself. Have you trusted in him? He is gracious and forgiving and loving and kind. And those of you who've already said yes to Jesus, can I ask, is there a part of your life you're holding back from his kingdom? Are you holding back from fully engaging with him? Have you given your life over to him? Have you submitted the things you hold on to? The one thing that you still lack, the, the thing that stands between you and God, the, the area of your life where you question his rule at all, have you given that over to him? And then can I ask, are you leveraging what you've been given for him? Are you sharing, joining him on mission? Those who know the king, do the king's work because they belong to him in his kingdom and they found their life in him. I'm gonna conclude in prayer and we're gonna do communion a little bit different today. Um, so uh, I'll pray and I'll explain that. Jesus, we expect so often that your kingdom's gonna come with force and it's gonna change everything right away. And we were reminded here that you have come, that you have ushered in your rule and your reign and you're ruling and reigning over the church and you've called us those who know you to be about the king and his work. Lord, help us to be people who follow after you and do your work in a broken world and to announce that there is a good king and he has come and is coming back. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.